All right, hello, this is JP. We're doing A Push Unit 2, uh, the constitutional period. We were discussing uh, the uh, getting into the Washington administration right after the constitutional ratification. But one of the think about it questions that we had was to what extent was the American Revolution considered a turning point in American policy society? We can still be answering that question. Another similar question to what extent did the ratification of the US Constitution maintain continuity and foster change in American politics and society? Learning about more of Washington and as administration, it still answers the question. But this will be the heart of the matter. Compare and contrast the ideologies and positions of Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists with those of Thomas Jefferson and eventually the Democratic Republicans. So we were discussing all that happened before, and we got to about the Federalist, Anti Federalist, and then real quick, Washington administration. What we're going to be discussing is more the foreign policy aspects of his administration since we covered uh, previously. Well, we discussed Hamilton's economic plan, we discussed Whiskey Rebellion that solidified the Constitution. Now we're going to get into world affairs and how that's actually going to have domestic impact, especially in politics and power. So, the French Revolution is going on. Inspired by our American Revolution, the French, uh, going through their political, and social, and economic turmoil, are in the process of challenging the ancient authorities of the monarchy, the nobility, the clergy, and they are also at war with the major European powers. Britain, Prussia, uh, Austria-Hungary, they're attacking France, not just because France is vulnerable with the revolution, but also, can anybody think why those nations, those empires, would want to defeat France during its revolution? Because the citizens, the middle class, okay, are challenging the ancient authority so that they could bring a new republic. Those ideals that they see are somewhat working in the United States, they want to bring that to France. Why would the other powers, Britain, Prussia, Austria-Hungary, want to take advantage of the situation? Other than, you know, a weak and distracted France, why else? Yes? To kind of subdue that kind of concept that you could live without um, a centralized power, like you oh. said. Okay, because we, those European powers, want to preserve the tradition. Yeah. The idea is that don't even think about having a revolution in Britain. Don't even think about having a revolution in Austria-Hungary. We have to support our own kind. Understand that Louis the Sixteenth is married to Marie Antoinette, who's from Austria. All right, that's that marriage. So she's under threat. Then Austria-Hungary has a legitimacy in trying to uh, quash the French Revolution. But the French are seeking our help, and they should. It makes sense. Jefferson is very sympathetic to the French cause. He's been in France, he was the ambassador, and he said, he convinces Washington, you should support the French. This isn't gonna be easy because Washington also has Hamilton, who prefers that we remain neutral, that way we have pro-British policies. Is there a reason for having pro-British policies? Yes. We still have uh, the remnants of like mercantilist society of like economy mm -hmm. and a lot of our economy is based off trade with Britain. Exactly. We need to preserve that trade with Britain in order to get this country going. We're relatively weak when it comes to economics, so we, we, we need to preserve that relationship uh, with Britain on the economic sense. So joining with France, allying with France, according to Hamilton, will sour that relationship really threaten our way of life here. And so Washington proclaimed, you know, he does that proclamation of neutrality. That proclamation of neutrality basically says, we're gonna, we're still doing our own thing. We're gonna, we're, we're not allying with France. We're not allying with Britain. We're just going about our business, and generally speaking. Ambassador Genet comes over and tries to negotiate with the Washington administration in order to get them to help the French. Citizen Genet breaks protocol in that he doesn't necessarily keep his negotiations 
uh, with Washington and his administration. He goes to appeal to the American people. So let's take a little quick video from the John Adams series about Citizen Genet to give you a better illustration of how this could affect matters. This is the end of monarchy! national interest to keep ourselves apart from affairs to which we have no attachment. Surely the cause of France is the cause of America, of the world. A threat to France is a threat to America. And we have a treaty, Mr. President, a treaty made when you were at war with England. I remind the ambassador that our treaty with France was made with King Louis. The King's murder renders that compact no longer binding. Thousands of your people have called themselves our brother. Since I landed in America, I have found many willing to fight. You will refrain, Ambassador Genet, from any further efforts to recruit our citizens to belligerent actions. I will not allow you to outfit privateers to join in your war against England. It is not for you to tell me this. Tread carefully, sir. The people will command me as they command you. Our ambassador to name. You will hear from me again, sir. And then I will speak to you with a million voices. And you will obey. Famous French diplomacy. Mr. Jefferson. Ambassador Genet has taken leave of his senses. Intense moment there with Genet, the threat of actually taking the taking to the people, taking this issue to the people who are very sympathetic to the French out of that loyalty from the uh, American Revolution. But Washington is being very wise here in proclaiming neutrality. Why do you think so? Why should we proclaim neutrality? Why can't? We, why does Washington say, "I know you helped us out, but we cannot help you out at this moment"? Again, with the economics, uh, if they help the French, then they're going to have to uh, fight uh, British forces as well, and their navy wasn't exactly as developed as most nations. Were. Bingo. Our military is very weak, and we still have to depend on that British trade and the economics, so we have to take a wiser course of action here. Okay? Um, did you notice anything in the video? Okay. You saw Jefferson on Genet's side, you saw Hamilton on Washington's side. What it was it about Hamilton? What did you notice about Hamilton? What was his point of view? What was his position? What did you think about how he addressed Genet? Knowing what you read about, knowing what you know about his position, what did you think? Yes. He was a little bit more um, uh, kind of condescending towards the, 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 the issue. Um, in that, like he, when he addressed Genet, he directly um, kind of void, uh, proclaimed the treaty to be void against uh, the entire even right. French Revolution, since it was by the king. Right. On a technicality. Yes. That way, to support his position, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It did seem condescending. Did seem kind of, I can't help you out right now. That that treaty is no longer binding because you have a whole new government. Mm -hmm. Okay. What did you see with Jefferson? 
How did Jeff what was Jefferson doing when Janet was speaking? Or that whole back and forth? How was he reacting? And could you explain why Jefferson may have reacted that way? Remember, that's the Secretary of State. That's our chief ambassador. Alright? And knowing what you know about Jefferson, his position, why do you think he what did, how did he react and why do you think he reacted that way? Anyway. Yeah. He was sort of quiet in the matter of kind of taking mental notes as to how to um, actually aid and be sympathetic, but he seemed to be willing to hear both sides of the matter mm -hmm. rather than immediately jump the gun and go for the one side. And he also has to remain, he represents the, the U.S. in one person and those foreign affairs. Okay, he, does not, he doesn't say much, but what do you know, what is his position? Does he want to support France, or does he want to echo Washington's position? He wants to support France. He wants to support France. So maybe that explains why he might be quiet in the sense that everyone in the room knows where he stands, despite his responsibility as Secretary of State. So he's going to let Janine uh, make his case for him, although we know Jefferson is uh, very pro-French here. But what, toward the end, how, how did Jefferson react when Janine walks out of the room? What does he do? You notice that he's like this? Yeah. And he puts his face in his hands? Why would he do that? Kind of embarrassed to the fact that Janet kind of uh, declared this entire un un revolution within their entire nation because he was going to return with millions. That could be the case, but what else? Did Jefferson win this argument? No. No. And actually, what do you think? Not only did he not win this argument, but it might have also been, like, is there any, is there any return to this? And is there any turning back from this? Did Janae just take an extreme position here? Mm -hmm. And Jefferson's like, I, I don't know what to do now. Could he be upset with Washington? Sure. Who else could he be upset with? Hamilton. Hamilton, right? To take that, you know, Jefferson even noticed that, oh my god, that technicality, that's how we're going to play this game. So, you see that Hamilton has that pro-British position, and then you see Jefferson has that pro-French position. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is more foundation for the partisanship that is brewing between Hamilton's camp and Jefferson's camp. Okay? Foreign policy is going to be very essential in that, in, that, in that debate and in those ideologies. What expands on this pro-British, pro-French, Hamilton versus Jefferson is then Jay's treaty. And John Jay is sent by Washington to Britain. And he brings back a treaty that is considered heavily favorable to the British. And it gives most favored trade status to Britain. That's awesome. For who? For us. Well, it's it's a soon, but let's remember, let's take it to the let's take it not necessarily for America, but let's take this dynamic here. Who's that awesome? Who would say, yes, I love that part about the, the treaty? Federalists. The Federalists, right? Why? Because they're from British and they like the commercial type of um, Bingo, because that pro-British, because of the trade, because of economics, finances. Remember, we need their British banks to help finance our debt. We need British trade, okay, to help our, you know, developing infant manufacturing, okay. We, you know, we got to have that major trade partner. So this is great. Who's not going to like this? <laughs> right. The developing Democratic Republicans, Jefferson, because oh, this is basically more British than it is French. It's almost like a slap in the face. It still retains the idea of neutrality, okay, because this is purely economic, all right? Now, the idea is that the British will remove themselves from those forts in the old Northwest, in the Northwest Territory, which doesn't happen. And it doesn't end one of this, one of those, this issue that's going to be quite common in the next uh, couple of decades. British impressment. British are seizing American ships. Where are these American ships headed? They're headed to French ports. And the British don't want that to happen, because why? Because Britain and France are now at war. So the Americans are saying, hey, you can't do that, that's a violation of our rights. 
And despite Jay's treaty trying to negotiate the ending of that, or at least try to limit that, it really doesn't. So this even upsets the pro-French and Democratic and Jefferson camp even further. Okay? You saw Pinkney's treaty, more with Spain. This actually is pretty good for us. It opens up the door, as opposed to that Jay Gardaki treaty from one of the articles. We are able to get access to the to New Orleans, the port of New Orleans. They're uh, on the Gulf Coast, okay? All right, so we are seeing how foreign policy is actually having an impact on the partisanship between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. All right, we saw Washington's presidents. This is cute, okay? Two terms, he's out by two terms. We call him Mr. President. We saw that in the, in the clip uh, the other day. He's got his cabinet, the idea of neutrality, special relationship with Great Britain, and then his wonderfully beautiful farewell address, which you all read about. And there was two major components to this farewell address. All right? Preserve the treaties that you make and avoid permanent alliances, especially with who? Europe. Because why? Because Europe is always a And if we're allied, if we have a permanent alliance with Britain, or France, or Spain, eventually one day, they're going to be at war, and guess what we have to do? We're going to get sucked in, and we have a weak military. We can't really afford this, this, this type of conflict, and it'll just drag on and drag on as usual. So we have to be very protective. So we have this kind of isolationist foreign policy. Okay? And then, which is beautiful, no partisanship. No political parties. No political parties. So remember, Washington's what political party? None. Although we do realize that when we sit down and we actually look at his policies and his administration, we can say that you are going to say he's not Federalist, he's not Democratic, Republican. But which way is the needle leading? The left. It's going this way. His policies are pro Federalist, very Federalist, okay? Granted, he's listening more to Hamilton than he is to Jefferson. Maybe that's how he feels. Maybe that's what he believes this should be there, especially with the pro-British policies. Okay? Now, are we going... This is a question I want to I plant the seed. All right? I'm planting the seed as usual. Preserving trees and avoiding permanent alliances. Are we going to keep to that? You say no as if you already know the history, and that's great. All right? But what about for the next couple of decades? What about the next 50 years? What about in 100 years? What about today? Think about this. Plant the seed about do we continue this policy that Washington suggested? His wisdom suggested. Do we keep to this? Are there times of, well, maybe we might modify the relationship? Maybe it's, it's depending on how we write these treaties, or did there come to a point where we go total 180? I don't know. We'll see as we move along, but think about it. Now let me ask you this question, since you guys already read, do we keep to the political parties? No political parties? No. No, no we've been, they were already, what? Right During his administration, they were already <laughs> setting up, right? So we know this is a given. There's political parties that happen immediately, okay? All right. Understand that idea of sectionalism, preserving it, this is very wise. Let's, let's also understand that who wrote most of this? Um, Alexander Hamilton. This guy. <laughs> okay, this is usually very complicated for students. Political party systems, okay? All right? We're usually in a dual party system, okay? That's, you know, two-party system has been uh, part of our, uh, our political identity ever since the beginning. It's very difficult for minor parties to get in, uh, to matter. But there's the idea of eras, political party eras, or political party systems. And then we're going to introduce you to the first political party system. And we like to, you know, definitely 1789, that's when we start rolling. Okay, that's when the United States starts rolling on the Constitution. And historians argue and differ between when this ends and when the second party system begins. Spoiler alert, there's a second one. Okay? 
But 1824, we'll talk about when we get there and why it might end there, why the second party system begins at that time. Or some say 1828, okay? We'll decide that. You'll decide. You can determine that. But under the first political party system, the two dominant parties are the Federalist and the Democratic Republicans. You can associate Alexander Hamilton with the Federalist, definitely, absolutely. And of course, Thomas Jefferson is the granddaddy of the Democratic Republicans, okay? Let's understand something. The Democratic Republicans, in your primary sources, may be referred to as Republicans. Not to be confused with today's Republican Party. But if you ever get a primary source that is dated around this time period, and you see Republicans, you need to tell yourself, it's the Democratic Republicans, okay? So that's how they'll, they'll probably be referred to as Republicans in your primary sources, okay? Let's, we gotta break this down. You definitely need to see. Don't think these political party systems as an absolutes. You yourself could agree with most of these policies, but disagree on, on, on one federalist policy and say, I actually agree with one of the Democratic Republicans. So there's no one's ever 100% a political party when you really look at it, even today. But where do you lean? Where does your, where, where does your, where does your mind, where does your ideology take you? Where do you lean? So you may want to choose the Federalist Party. You can still have disagreements. And you can say, I, I, I prefer, uh, you know, I, I like the French. I'm pro-French, but I really agree with having a strong central government, having a loose interpretation of the Constitution. That's fine, okay? But don't, don't try to work in absolutes, okay? Now, the Federalists, are, again, national policies, just like we saw when we discussed the contract ratification. Strong central government, centralized power, all right, at the federal level. Loose interpretation, or loose constructionist, we can interchange those words in this context, okay? Can we get an example of Hamilton having loose interpretation of the Constitution? Uh, the bank. The bank, and how does, where in the Constitution does he uh, stretch out? The uh, interpretation there. The necessary and proper clause. The necessary and proper clause when it comes to the bank, because is bank in the Constitution? No. Not at all. But Hamilton found it in the necessary and proper clause. Because he argued that it is necessary and proper for the economics, the American economy, and financial system. Whereas Jefferson argued, uh, no, 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 strict interpretation. I don't know, you can't sell that. All right? Very. Let's understand that Hamilton and the Federalists accept, totally accept, that the United States is an agricultural economy. That is our prime, primary economy, it's agriculture. But Hamilton wants to emphasize more growth in commerce and manufacturing to develop our industry, to remain competitive with our foreign uh, rivals. Right? And so we need, he wants to develop policies like the tariffs, all right, protective tariffs, uh, high tariffs, that way we can uh, develop our infant industries, okay? So we can encourage American consumers to purchase American manufactured goods. If you increase the price on foreign manufactured goods, it'll discourage American consumption of those goods, which will increase American demand for those manufactured goods. Where can they get them? Those infant American industries can be developed to meet that American consumer demand. And that will make us more competitive, help us generate more revenue, right, to pay off our debt, and that's great. Of course, this tends to favor certain sectors of society and the economy, like bankers, like industrial owners, factory owners, okay? And of course, those are concentrated more in urban areas. As you can see, the rich, the well-born, the able, that's a famous quote about who tends to be favored among the Federalists, but also merchant bankers. Pro-British policies, of course, with trade, and of course, diplomacy, not favor in favor of the French Revolution, want to avoid that, to avoid souring the relationship with Britain. And while this first party system is not very uh, big on the whole regional aspect, you could make an argument that Federalists are found primarily in the Northeast, like in the New England region. Okay? But let's understand that you can find Federalists 
in the West, in the South, okay, depending on their interests, okay? You can't find merchants in Charleston, South Carolina, okay? So don't try, don't get too uh, absolute with, the, with, with these uh, details of each party. Let's go to the Democratic Republicans and compare and contrast uh, their policies and their positions. As we've noticed, Democratic Republicans under Jefferson were on the state's rights, okay? Understand that Hamilton is going to prefer to identify primarily as American. He's going to come from a national viewpoint. He's going to develop policies that are going to strengthen and, 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 and uh, improve the United States, the Union. Jefferson and the Republicans, Democrat Republicans, are going to identify and primarily uh, emphasize the states. It's the state. We're still a, a citizen of Virginia. We're still a citizen of Massachusetts. We're still trying to develop that idea that I'm American. Okay? That identity about being American, being a nationalist, still growing, still developing because we still have 13. We're growing, you know, we got more than 13 now, but we are still kind of more allied or have allegiance more toward our state than we do to the Union. More emphasis on local and state governments, just like under the Articles of Confederation. Strict constructions, literal interpretation. Bank's not in there, why do we still have, why do we have this bank? Got to make a compromise, we saw that. Okay? So, the agricultural vision of Jefferson, as opposed to Hamilton's vision. Hamilton has a vision, a future of where we have stronger industry, stronger manufacturing, stronger trade, okay? Again, remember, he's not saying no agriculture, he's just saying, we, if we want to remain competitive and be prosperous, we have to try to develop this sector of the economy. Jefferson doesn't like that sector of the economy. He understands that they have their purpose, however, he has a vision of an agricultural lifestyle that it's the farmer, it's the individual farmer, a small land-owning farmer, that should be the that's, the, that's the citizen, that's the true American citizen. And that's what we should emphasize. And if we go toward Hamilton's vision, we are gonna lose that American farmer. He's, you know, the American farmer is independent because he's beholden to no one other than the land. Hamilton, according to Jefferson, his vision with the industry is that you start growing a population that is dependent on owners, on these manufacturing owners, these factory owners, and that to earn a wage, to make a living, you have to depend upon an owner, okay, rather than making something of yourself from land. And you can see why this appeals more to the small farmers, plantation owners given, favoring the agricultural south, okay? Artisans, the plain folk, common folk, common folk. It appeals more to the common folk, that average American citizen, because a majority of Americans are common folk. They're gonna accuse the Federalists of being more toward the elites. This is a country of elites, a nation of elites. And they're gonna say, we're more with the common folk, right? The common American, Maybe, you know, small land. Maybe it doesn't have land. We, you know, the blacksmith, okay? Um, Anti-British because they're pro-French, they have those French allegiances. Again, the regional aspect of this, we understand why the South, okay? We understand the West, but let's be careful that you can find Republicans, Democratic Republicans, in New England as well, okay? Depending on maybe where they live, depending on their interests, you could have a blacksmith that lives in Boston who prefers the Republican ideology. And that's fine, okay? But big picture, you can see the, the regional areas with this first political part. So understand that they have different visions and they have different ideologies when it comes to the role of the federal government and the role of the citizen and who is the ideal citizen and what emphasis we should put on the American economy and how we should develop the American identity Two different visions, okay? 
Yet they believe, both believe that they have this common goal of American prosperity. They have different approaches, all right, different visions. And of course, that you know adds to that those debates and that animosity that develops between these two camps. The election of 1796 is the first competitive election. Because remember, Washington was walked right into the White House. That was easy. We have John Adams. And he's the Federalist nominee against his, aw, that was his friend, Thomas Jefferson. He's running against his friend. But because of the whole Britain and France and the revolution, the relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson soured. And the election of 1796 really also, you know, continued that sour relationship. It was pretty close, because as you can see, Remember, we talked about the Electoral College, how this is set up, all right? And according to this map, let me ask you this question. According to your understanding of the first party system, does this electoral map reflect what you understand about the first party system? What do you think? Yeah? Yes, because the, well, even though um, you have the, the variations, you can see that the Federalists um, were mainly concentrated in the New England area. And on top of that, they're mostly um, where there would be ports, and it's more obviously based on a commercial type of economy um, as a state. And then the Democratic Republicans were more concentrated towards the South and the West. Bingo, exactly. Understanding the regional aspects of the first party system, this, you can analyze this and say, I can, I can understand the why, the why John Adams, Federalist candidate, was able to win those states in the Northeast, okay? And you can understand why Thomas 